Welcome to History 361, the History of Germany, Week 6. We're going to look at the background to World War I, that is the Great War of 1914 to 1918, and carry it on through the end of the war. So some background information just to review. View, review. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, which Prussia, or Germany, won, uh, demanded a sizable war indemnity from France. And it also seized uh, the provinces of Alsace-Lorraine from France. So France uh, would become embittered by all of this. Similarly, in 1878, the Congress of Berlin ended the Rus Russo-Turkish War, which the Ottoman Empire, that is, Turkey, lost. The Ottoman Empire lost possessions in the Balkan Peninsula. We're going to look at the uh, map of this in a minute to other powers. Austria-Hungary received administrative powers over Bosnia and Herzegovina, both of which contain many Serbs. Meanwhile, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania won independence. Then there were all kinds of entangling alliances of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which we're going to look at here in a minute. And in 1908, Austria-Hungary, fearing Serbian nationalism and possible Serbian expansionism, formally annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now this would be very interesting for you to read and it talks about some of the um, uh, entangling alliances of the late 19th century. Uh, one of those was the Austro-German alliance uh, from 1879 to 1918. So between uh, Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the Habsburgs and the German Empire. And then they so show the Triple Alliance of 1882 to 1915, which involved the German Empire, off the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and also Italy. Then they show the Franco-Russian uh, Alliance of 1894 to 1917, and which, of course, Russian Empire and France were allied. This was expanded to the Triple Entente of 1907 to 1917, which would include France and Russia and, of course, the United Kingdom. Now, down here they're showing in the striped areas very independence and nationalistic movements that were sponsored by Russia from 1879 after the Congress of Berlin all the way through 1914. And so you have, um, you know, part of the problem here is all of these old uh, Balkan states, this is the Balkan Peninsula, which had pretty well uh, fallen out of the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, the Ottoman Empire, this, the Sikh Empire of the 19th century was falling apart, especially after uh, the Russo-Turkish War. And uh, so there was really a vacuum of power here. And um, a number of your books describe how the Serbs who were, you know, mainly um, led by uh, Muslims and had, you know, their base at Belgrade, uh, were kind of always against the Romanians who had their headquarters at Bucharest. And so these two were kind of always at one another. Neither one wanted uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire to, to really take over. And, of course, after um, the... Uh, uh, conclusion of the uh, Russo-Turkish War. In fact, um, you know, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire expanded into what was Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, eventually um, all of this would, would uh, come to bear um, in this Balkan Peninsula down here and lead directly to war. Now, the Habsburg dynasty. Sarajevo was located in Bosnia, and the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, along with his wife Sophie, went down to Bosnia, hoping to, to you know, get the Bosnian people to support the, the Habsburgs more. But they were really stepping into, you know, a hot nationalistic battle there. Um, a Serbian nationalist organization who wanted uh, 
the Austrians, the Habsburgs, out of Bosnia uh, was called the Black Hand, and it assassinated Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. Now, this was important because Archduke was the next in line for the Habsburg throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So a, uh, a war will start over this. Uh, Hop, the Austrian Habsburg sent an ultimatum saying that certain conditions had to be met. Those conditions were not met. So then all of those, an attack was then going to happen against Serbia. And um, the end result was all of those entangling alliances uh, now come to bear. So once someone declares war against someone else, then the whole thing will blow up. So Austria-Hungary is convinced that the Serbian government had supported the assassins. So on July 23rd of 1914, Austria-Hungary presented an ultimatum to Serbia to desist from subversive activities and to agree to a joint investigation of the assassination of the Archduke within Serbia itself. Now, that would have been, you know, that, you know, Serbia was its own country its own nation. So for uh, Austro-Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to insist that they take part in an investigation within Serbia itself was just ludicrous. And um, so uh, when Serbia did not accept that ultimatum of a joint investigation, then on July 28th of 1940, Austria-Hungary, that is the Austro-Hungarian Empire, declared war against Serbia, and then the snowball effect of those entangling alliances then took place, um, where other powers would declare um, war against one another. The central powers, you might think of the mnemonic memory device being Germany, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, and Bulgaria. The Allies were Great Britain, France, Russia, Romania for a time, Italy, Japan, later on the United States, plus many more. World War I was a world war, world war fighting in Europe, China, Pacific Islands, German colonies in Africa, and the North and South Atlantic. So this was the course of the war. Germany planned to attack France first. And France had a whole series of defenses. So what Germany decided to do in the Schlieffen plan was to attack France first, but not directly, by going around its defenses uh, to the west, by going to the north, that is, through the independent country of Belgium. So the first thing that uh, Germany did was attack, um, invade Luxembourg and Belgium. On September of 1914 was the first Battle of the Marne, and the Allies uh, stopped the German advance. Almost ceaseless trench warfare uh, began after this point, in, including the use of uh, gassing troops, which of course uh, was something really unheard of and something that led to uh, many disabilities on the part of the poor soldiers in the trenches. Britain decided to literally starve Germany into submission. And so Britain inaugurated a, com a complete naval blockade of Germany. And it did not make distinction between contraband, that is between war supplies, at least that's what contraband means in, in a definition of international law, and peaceful supplies. And so Germany likewise retaliated and began uh, against the Allies submarine warfare. In May of 1915, the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, was sunk. 139 Americans were among the 1,200 killed um, on the Lusitania. And by the way, Besides passengers, the Lusitania did have some munitions that it was carrying on board. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson demanded that Germany end attacks against neutral ships, and Germany agreed for a time. In February of 1917, however, Germany declared unrestricted submarine warfare. 
meaning that the Germans would not restrict attacks to enemy ships, but would also attack ships of neutral nations trading with their enemies. U.S. President uh, Woodrow Wilson was highly upset by the declaration. Now, one of the things that World War I involved is that is the concept of total war. And total war was where nations mobilized both their social and economic resources at home to meet war demands. Governments began to control industry for the duration of the war, inaugurating such things as rationing, wage controls, price controls, and other means in order to win the war. Meanwhile, in March 1917, the March Revolution occurred in Russia. So the Russian autocrat, uh, the Russian czar, uh, was um, tumbling, you know, at this point in time as socialist forces uh, were beginning to take over Russia. In April of 1917, the U.S. Congress declared war on the Central Powers, quote, to make the world safe for democracy, end quote. In December of 1917, Russia signed an armistice with Germany uh, following the October Revolution there. And in March 1918, in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Russia yielded Poland, the Baltic states, and the Ukraine to Germany. By July of 1918, the Second Battle of the Marne occurred, and the Allies overcame uh, this renewed German offensive. By August 8th of 1917, the Allies had breached the German lines and a four-year deadlock had, was broken. On November 9th of 1918, Kaiser, uh, that is Emperor Wilhelm, Wilhelm II of Germany abdicated. The German Republic was proclaimed. And on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 was Armistice Day whereby the war ended. The results of the war were horrifying. Estimates of between 10 and 13 million people died and some 20 million were wounded. Four empires were ended essentially during the course of the war. The German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire, which of course fell to a socialist revolution. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and, Uni and Yugoslavia were created as uh, independent nations. The peace negotiations at Versailles in 1919 involved some 70 delegates from 27 victorious nations. But in actuality, the Big Four controlled the conference. And the big four were U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, Prime Minister David Lloyd George of Great Britain, Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau of France, and Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando of Italy. Wilson wanted the creation of a League of Nations to assure future peace and security. Germany signed the treaty on June 28, 1919, the fifth anniversary of the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles, where Bismarck had proclaimed the German Empire in 1871. All of this was very highly symbolic. The treaty included the following terms. Number one, war guilt and war reparations. Germany was to claim responsibility for the war and was forced to pay uh, for all civilian war damages. The amount of the reparations was still to be determined later on by a special commission. This war guilt and war reparations was later seen as the big biggest single mistake of Versailles, leading, some people say, some historians say, directly to um, the problems of the Weimar Republic in Germany and, of course, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. Number two, the League of Nations was established to secure future peace. The League of Nations was to institute a system of collective security versus the pal palance of power system of earlier years, 
that had quite clearly failed and had resulted in all kinds of entangling alliances. Number three, Alsace Lorraine was returned to France. And uh, number four, the League of Nations administered the Tsar Basin of Germany for 15 years with its coal production taken by France for reparations. Within 15 years, a plebiscite was to be held in the Tsar Basin to determine whether the people wanted to join Germany or France. Keep in mind the Tsar Basin. Keep in mind the next thing, five, the Rhineland of Germany was to be occupied by Allied forces for 15 years and a 30 mile wide, uh, wide, mile wide strip along the east bank of the Rhine River was to be demilitarized. Both of these were to be very important later on in the beginning of what becomes World War II. Germany was to limit its army to 100,000 men. Its navy was also to be limit, limited, and it was not to have any military aircraft, tanks, submarines, or poison gas. In other separate peace negotiations, which involved Austria, Hungary, Turkey, and Bulgaria, Austro, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up into two separate nations, Austria and Hungary, and Austria was forbidden to form a union with Germany. Remember this for the beginning of World War II as well. The League of Nations gave mandates, that is mandated territories, out of the old Ottoman Empire to Great Britain and France. This is when Great Britain was given mandates over Iraq and Palestine and France over Lebanon and Syria. So um, that would later on become problematic. Now all of this is shown in a map. Uh, here and in green we see areas lost by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We see areas lost by the Russian Empire. Areas lost by the German Empire. Areas lost by Bulgaria and this demilitarized zone that was set up along the Rhine River. If there's any questions please feel free to email or phone me. I'm always happy to help. Thank you and have a good week.